Good morning once again, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to our webinar. Today's topic is enhancing everyday activities in dementia care. And again, we're so happy you're here with us today. These complimentary webinars are brought to you through a collaboration of our sponsorship with O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choices Hospice and Palliative Services, Caring Companions at Home, Chatterton and Associates, the Wealth Management Team, as well as us here at Alzheimer's Orange County. My name is Melissa Klabe. I'm the Director of Education here at Alzheimer's Orange County, and I will be your host today. Our sponsors are providing these webinars to you as a service to the community on topics that are beneficial for anyone who cares for and works with older adults, and we hope you find today's presentation informative and useful. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Kim Bailey. Kim has worked in the field of gerontology as a lecturer and a professional for 30 years. She holds a Master's of Science degree in gerontology and a BA in sociology, both from California State University, Fullerton. Ms. Bailey is the Programs and Education Specialist with Alzheimer's Orange County, where she's responsible for developing and presenting programs and education for families and professionals throughout our community. Additionally, Ms. Bailey works with the social engagement programs and early stage programs offered for people with memory loss and their partners, and she coordinates the organization's education and support program for individuals and families living with intellectual disabilities and Alzheimer's disease. And again, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Kim. Thank you so much, Melissa, and I'm so delighted to be here with all of you this morning uh, to talk a little bit about uh, everyday activities that can be used in dementia care, whether you are a family member listening in, caring for someone at home, or whether you're one of the many professionals online with us today. And I was just thinking a little bit about um, our last topic that we had with our webinar last month. I know many of you were online to hear Dr. Galindo, and she was talking about some of the behavioral expressions that are common to this illness. And I was just thinking about the fact that one of the most effective ways uh, to intervene in some of the behavioral expressions that we see is through the use uh, the application of many of the simple activities that we're going to talk about today. So I'm really uh, thrilled that Laura Bronson, our education coordinator, was able to schedule these uh, uh, webinars one right after the other because they, uh, her talk really provided a good foundation for the information that we're going to share today. So thank you, Laura Bronson, for that. Um, okay, so what we're going to do today and the time that we have together is begin by just, you know, doing that kind of customary overview that we do, a short overview of the disease and really how it impacts our ability to connect with people living with uh, dementia. And then we're going to go into a number of strategies that we can use uh, for planning meaningf meaningful activities. So we'll talk about person-centered, which I know many of you are familiar with, as well as David Troxell's best friends approach. Uh, I'm going to touch on a, a, a method that many of you have heard about that's used with respect to children's issues, but they're now using it for adults, and that's the Montessori method. Uh, I'll talk about contented involvement. Uh, I want to go through a number of uh, examples of successful activities that you can use, and then I'll end with just a discussion, a brief discussion about how to right-size activities for individuals as they progress through the stages of dementia. So we have you know, kind of a full agenda to get through in the next hour, and I want to make sure I leave time uh, for questions as well. So I'll try to move along at a pretty good pace here. Okay, so the obligatory, what is dementia? And I know for many of you, you're so seasoned and you could uh, teach this part of the class, but we're always remarking about how we have people new to the illness online every time. And so, uh, so my apologies to those of you that are pros, and this is for those of you who are new. Uh, but really, when we talk about dementia, we're talking about a syndrome that describes a whole host of illnesses, all of which are progressive and degenerative. Uh, and so these are brain diseases that we're talking about that slowly worsen over time. And so 
uh, truly we're talking about brain damage. So nerve cells in the brain are dying. Uh, they're, they're ceasing to function properly. Uh, and when that happens, we're going to see slowly over time changes in memory, communication, and behavior. And of the many, many types of dementia, Alzheimer's disease is ranked as number one. It's the most common type of dementia. And we think that it makes up probably about 75% of cases. So quickly, because I could actually teach a whole class just on this one slide. On the left-hand side, um, you're going to see just some of the top types of dementia. Uh, again, we're operating with an umbrella term, and if you want to kind of think of uh, the term as describing any type of progressive degenerative brain impairment, again, that's affecting memory, uh, thinking, and judgment. Under that umbrella, some of the top types are on the left. Alzheimer's disease, as I said, is number one, but we also see a lot of Lewy body dementia, FTD or frontal temporal uh, dementia. Years ago, we called that Pix disease. We see vascular dementia, Parkinson's, Huntington's, alcohol-related dementia, CTE, which you know is uh, that's a term that describes like what we see with football players that have had a lot of um, brain injuries, uh, maybe hunt uh, wrestlers, etc. Um, so these are all irreversible types of disease, and I will also mention as a caveat that more and more what we're seeing are people that have maybe more than one type of dementia. So those individuals that agree to donate their brains upon opsy, autopsy, we see that they may have for example, Alzheimer's disease as well as vascular and maybe Lewy body dementia as well. So there's a lot of mixed dementia out there as well. And then for your information, um, on the right side of the umbrella, you see just a small list of what is, is really a growing list of conditions that are considered to be reversible. And so the reason I want to just touch on this briefly with all of you is that you're out there for the most part, many of you working in the community community and there are many older adults there that have, lack a proper diagnosis. So this is going to be my opportunity to encourage you to be advocates with the older adults that you see that are undiagnosed but yet exhibiting symptoms of Alzheimer's disease because in some cases there are these reversible conditions that are mimicking dementia. And so things like undiagnosed, untreated, unchecked depression, um, at drug interactions, uh, maybe the seniors are on a multitude of drugs that they're getting from different providers and there's some type of interaction going on that's inappropriate. Uh, severe nutritional deficiencies, maybe a severe shortage of potassium or B12. They could have a severe imbalance in their thyroid. They could have an infection like, um, uh, um, I, I'm just thinking about one uh, woman that we heard about when I worked at UCI Mind in the clinic for a, a time. We saw a woman who came in with a severe untreated sinus infection. Her, she was so impacted that she literally was delirious and couldn't think straight and, and presented with a type of dementia. And of course, with a course of uh, antibiotics, that began to clear and she began to... Uh, lose those symptoms of dementia, but sometimes just a UTI can cause uh, dementia-like symptoms. So that is a huge list. These are just a few things, but all of them present great compelling reasons for people to go through a workup for, for dementia. So sort of keep that in top of mind as you encounter seniors out in the community who say things like, well, I don't want to go get a diagnosis or I'm afraid or I don't want to put someone through all of that, etc. So, um, yeah, so I'll go to the next slide. All this to say that uh, we know now that dementia affects the whole brain over time. And so it's not just about memory, but for each area of the brain where cells are affected and cell loss occurs, you, we start to see problems with language and communication, the ability for people to do the common tasks that they've done easily and readily all their lives, that starts to break down as does their visual spatial perception, the way they perceive the world. And of course, with all of this going on, it can't help but affect their mood and behavior. And in fact, their behavior 
as we talked about last time, really is no longer a choice. And so we start to see people acting out. And as we learned last month, they're really trying to express some type of an unmet need. So this slide, we use this in several of our uh, presentations and I'm really, uh, I really like this slide because it sort of describes the world of a person with Alzheimer's in a, in a compelling way. And if you start over at the left hand side there, that's a good starting point because that's actually where they live. They exist in a state of confusion. Now granted, some days are better than others, but to some degree, every person with Alzheimer's or, or a type of dementia experiences confusion 24 seven. So that's their baseline. And if you stop to think about that and really start to think about what that would be like if you lived that way day in and day out, you would realize that when we're confused all the time, that leads to a level of discomfort that would be pretty intolerable. So if you think about it, when we get confused to that extent and start to feel uncomfortable, it's inevitable that we're gonna act out. And so this is, this is classic human behavior, right? When it happens to me, I just call it a meltdown. And so what happens for someone with dementia is that this cycle is sort of going on all the time. 24 seven and for some people it can repeat over and over again over the course of, a, of every day. But the good news is that the things that we learned today, I mean some of the tools that we learned last month, some of the tools that we'll learn today can help to mitigate this cycle, can help to stop it from recurring all the time. And so that's really powerful. And as caregivers, we actually have that power to stop that person from going through this, this cycle day in and day out. And so that's really good news and I'm happy to share it. So I'll be showing you several photos as we go throughout our, go through our presentation today. And they come from, and this is one of them. And this is actually a series of photos that were taken by a fabulous photographer. Her name is Kathy Greenblatt. And she just uh, went around the world taking pictures of people with Alzheimer's who were engaged in what we call person-centered care. And I know this term is not unfamiliar to most of you. Um, and so this example is, is just really great because this, you know, think back to this cycle. This is a gentleman who was living in a care facility in Japan and he is experiencing so much anxiety that he would, would refuse to leave his room. And so this aid in his facility learned from his family the type of music that he really loved. And she would then go into his room, play his favorite music and dance him, literally dance him out of his room. So, I mean, that is a great tool, right? We know that music is an effective tool in easing anxiety and it produces such wonderful outcomes in people. So in the case of this man who had been spending so much time just sitting in his room, feeling miserable and refusing to leave, here, she, here is this aide who discovered the key to breaking this cycle of behavior for this gentleman, just really, you know, it, that that key lied, laid in his, the, his love for this particular type of music. So we all have the power, you know, to make changes in people's behaviors simply by knowing a little bit more about them. And so I just love this picture because just look at his expression, look how happy he is. And so problem solved, is it always this easy? I can see all of you shaking your heads. No, it's not always this easy, but sometimes it is. So we can have victories, you know, over some of these problems um, and we're gonna be effective more times than not. So person-centered, all this means really is that we're gonna take, we're gonna plan our activities for the people we're caring for based around the life history, personal preferences, needs, and interests of the persons we're caring for. And those activities should produce a, a feeling of comfort, 
um, a feeling of belonging or attachment. They make people have a sense of purpose or occupation. They promote a sense of identity, et cetera. And those, that all sounds kind of fancy. That sounds like fancy talk. It's not really. And, and I've actually attached a very simple worksheet um, it's called the Meaningful Activities Worksheet, and it just gives you an opportunity to jot down things that you know about the person. Um, and then you're going to take what you know about this client's past, their life work, their interests, their hobbies, all of those things, and use it to plan activities that matter. Um, so here, here are those things. And those of you who are on the line that are family members, you know all these things. And so, um, you know, you're a step ahead of the game. But if you're working in a care community and you've got uh, residents in a memory care unit that are new to you, you need to, you owe it to them to learn about their history. So I'll just give you uh, an example. I was doing some consulting in a memory care unit. It wasn't here in Orange County, it was up in Riverside County. And this was uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, I was looking you know, just kind of looking at some of the residents and doing some observations. And there was a gentleman, looked kind of like the man in the picture here, but he was completely slumped over, very non-responsive. And the staff was telling me, oh, he never participates. He rarely speaks. And he's just pretty non-responsive. And I said, well, what do we know about this man? And so I started looking through his files and I discovered that he was like this hotshot coach that had been, um, he, I think it was the University of, of um, Nevada. He was, first of all, he was a PhD and he was a award-winning football coach. I don't know anything about sports, so you're gonna have to forgive me here, but apparently he had led his team to like a national championship, like five years in a row or something. So he was, you know, this pretty famous coach. So um, anyway, I looked across the room and I sort of yelled across the room, hey coach, you know, this man's head, he snapped, it snapped up. He looked up and he, he goes, yo. And um, I said, hey, coach, hey, listen, we're going to do some sports now. Can you help me with this activity? You know, and I had him. I mean, he was engaged. He wanted to help me. And so, you know, this is what I'm talking about on this previous slide on the second bullet here, I gave him a sense of comfort because now we were in an area that he felt comfortable with, a sense of belonging. There was a purpose to what I did with him. It related to his occupation and his sense of identity. So that's just a little example. Another woman that I was working with that same day, uh, later on around lunchtime, she kept coming back in the kitchen while the staff was preparing lunch and she was sort of quote unquote getting in their way. That's how they described it to me. And I said, well, you know what? I just looked in her file and I discovered that guess what? She used to own a restaurant. <laughs> so, you know, th it's natural for her to feel like she should be doing something in the kitchen. So we ended up giving her a job, which was, um, just she was very impaired so there wasn't a lot she could do but I gave her the job of putting the placemats on the table she was very happy to do that it was the perfect a perfect task for her because it involved a lot of repetition and um, you know she was there doing something related to what she used to do it gave her that feeling of belonging that purpose that sense of identity again you take what you know about the client's past but you have to know about it so, you know, that little simple hand, uh, handout, if you're not already using something like that in your professional life uh, with your clients or in your personal life with your family charge, I, I highly, highly recommend it. Just take what you know to foster that connection. It works with uh, meaningful one-on-one -on -one activities. It works in group activities. Use the approach all the time and you can brainstorm, you know, with other members of the family to you know, come up with some examples of things that you can do with the, with the um, individual, things that matter. That's the, that's the point I want to make. These are, you come up with activities, they may not be very elaborate, but they're dignified and they matter to that individual. I love, love, love this picture. This is a woman who is a participant in a daycare, in a day center in India. And they found out she was a mathematician. 
that was her life work so they got her this blackboard and so what does she do during the day she does complicated mathematical calculations on the board for you know that's her major activity during the day and look at her expression she's very engrossed in her work very intent uh, now whether those calculations make any sense or not I really have no idea but does it matter no it does not because again she's doing the type of work that matters to her so another great example seen through the eyes of photographer uh, Kathy Greenblatt great example of person-centered care okay and when you do this here are the benefits so I mean when I talk about person-centered care it's just it's not just lip service this approach really works it respects the person's dignity and sense of self it gives them a sense of purpose makes them feel needed it provides opportunities to connect and socialize with others and it really works in terms of those behaviors it redirects them away from negative thoughts moods and behaviors so can you tell it's my favorite approach <laughs> So um, our next approach is the Montessori method. Now I'm just learning about this. Um, as the title indicates, it's not just for kids. Um, they are applying this method now for adults with dementia. I'm seeing it, I'm just learning about it, but I'm seeing it applied mainly in clinical settings like hospitals and uh, medical clinics, etc. It uh, engages people with dementia by stimulating the mind with activities that are that utilize fine motor skills and build self-esteem. Uh, it purports to emphasize practical life activities that promote sensory stimulation, concentration, and coordination, and it provides choices in the selection of activities with the ability to repeat the action as often as needed. So, you know, one of the things I was seeing that they were doing with this was like sorting activities, and I was looking at one thing that they were doing where they had like a um, uh, I don't know, like a pan full of rice, and they were asking um, the the participants to sort through the rice and to try to find like tre objects in the rice. So that was the part that was utilizing the fine motor skills, etc. So, but I saw some other things that I liked. They were doing, they were providing some dementia care cool, uh, tools in both the clinic and acute care setting. So in other words, like in the waiting room, they had activities for the patients, which I loved, along with resources for family members. So imagine you're taking uh, your dementia uh, family member to the doctor and there were things for that family member to do while they're waiting as well as some uh, information for you to look at and then in the hospital setting they are putting together carts as you see pictured here with um, activities on them that include welcome kits for the families uh, and then activities for staff to do or volunteers to do with uh, patients with dementia who are in the hospital setting. So we know that patients uh, struggle in hospital settings. So I'm very excited to try and learn more about you know the use of this approach in those settings and maybe we can do more on this later, but I think anything we can do to improve uh, the care of dementia patients in hospital and acute care settings is really exciting and we'll try to get more information on that to report back on as we go along. Um, and then contented involvement, some of you may be aware of this. This is a term that simply describes an emotional state where the person with dementia is occupied and engaged. And so basically with dementia, we worry about when people are either overstimulated or understimulated. So it's a little bit of a balancing act. If they're overstimulated, that's not good. We're going to see behaviors. If they're understimulated, that's not good. We're going to see behaviors. So we want to sort of balance everything out and we want to get people, quote unquote, in the zone. And so the way we do that is through the development of you know it's just you know kind of a short list of favorite activities that people can do 
that keep them in that that zone of contentment and that can include things like looking at photo albums um, it could be just having some tea or coffee could be sitting in a chair and looking outside it could involve holding a familiar object listening to music all of these things and so um, I, I this picture here of this woman gazing outward I I put that in here because it reminds me of a woman I cared for when I was in a personal caregiving situation and this is what she liked to do this is how she was in the zone and it kind of drove me crazy because I considered myself to be you know a good caregiver so I was always trying to come up with you know sort of these creative activities and she really didn't want to do anything she just wanted to sit in her recliner and stare out into the neighborhood and it turns out you know I talked to her family and they said oh no don't worry about it that's what she's always done she is nosy you know basically she loves to just check out what's going on out in the neighborhood and so I learned that to accept that you know it was hard for me though because I'm just sort of this ADD caregiver I wanted to you know, I put a bird feeder out there and wind chimes and all this stuff because I felt like it wasn't enough, but really it was. And here's the thing. A lot of times we try too hard to come up with these fancy activities when people really don't need that. They just need simple things that bring them comfort. And so it could be just folding towels. Uh, someone was telling me the other day that their loved one sits and folds Kleenex you know they fold tissues and they make stacks of them so and they wondered if that was okay well yes it is okay because if the expression on their face their loved one's face is similar to the photo that we see here um, you know we want people to be in a state of contented involvement and um, you know we it's up to us again as I said to just come up with a short list of these go-to activities so that if a person starts to get agitated or upset we've got this you know go-to list and you know you see the music on there uh, that is usually a winner for almost everyone I know um, if you can load up an iPod you know with people's favorite music from you know back in the day that is a great way to go painting you know we here at Alzheimer's uh, Orange County you know for years we've been doing our, our famous <laughs> our world famous memories in the making art program I mean, if you could just see the classes that we do here you know everybody's head is just bent over and people are painting and they're so content listening to music and painting uh, there's so many things that people that we can do with people that bring them simple joy and that state of contentment so uh, be thinking about that and then this approach is another one of my favorites and it was developed by a colleague of mine from years ago his name is David Troxell and he wrote the best friends approach to dementia care and his premise is that he says that what a person with dementia needs most of all is a friend a best friend and so he says that when you're working in memory care and you function as a best friend the person, the people that you're caring for feel safe, secure, and valued. And when you function as a best friend, you're providing more interaction and more pleasure. And so, I mean, he's written several books on this, and I'm trying to boil it down to one slide. But basically, it means that you're going to join with your residents instead of being directive toward them so instead of like looking at residents saying all right everybody come over here and sit down we're gonna have a sing-along you know and pointing at them and gesturing to them you you join with them you get them you know arm in arm and say hey you know what I feel like doing I feel like singing now do you feel like singing along with me it'll be fun so you're really enjoying with them is that even a word I'm, I'm trying to think if that's a word but it's engaging with them on their level and and being you know I mean think about it for yourself if you had dementia wouldn't you rather have a BFF to hang around with as opposed to a, an aide a paid aide or, or um, you know someone that was you know in charge of you so it's more peer support as opposed to um, you know being bossed around or being told what to do 
So the best friends approach. And again, that's David Troxel. And his last name is spelled T-R-O-X-E-L. David Troxel, if you want to check out um, his books. And he actually wrote uh, a best friends approach to activities. And that's a great resource as well. Okay, right sizing activities. So what I mean here is that obviously people are going to progress through the disease. And although that progression is typically slow and you know it takes place across the years, uh, every person is different, but for the most part, it's a gradual progression. We have to adapt and simplify activities as we go along. And what we don't want to do is take things away from people. So, um, and this is something that family caregivers, you know, obviously feel compelled to do all the time. They feel like, oh my gosh, my, my wife has dementia, so she loves to cook. I've got to, you know, kick her out of the kitchen immediately now that she has the diagnosis. So, um, you know, what we want to do is make sure that people are able to do the things that they want, that they love to do but we just want to make sure that they're safe and, um, and that they're able to do these activities successfully. So, um, so if I had someone that loved to cook, I would want to make sure that she could cook safely and I would want to right size that activity. So you take, so in other words, let's say that person loved to bake and they used to bake everything from scratch. So obviously with Alzheimer's disease, over time, you're gonna want to work with that person side by side to keep them safe. And you know, as, as she declines, you know, you want to, um, you know, there's no reason why she can't continue to mix um, things and you know, you're gonna have to help with measuring and you know, you're going to have to do everything together. You know, I'm struggling a little bit here because I can't cook. <laughs> I should have used a different example because I know they mix and they cut and I'm not sure what else people do, but um, uh, the best thing I make actually is reservations. So that's a poor attempt at humor there. But anyway, my point is that is that you join that person and you 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 help you help them do the, the cooking together. But if it's cookies, it would maybe evolve to the point where you buy the cookie dough and then you just drop the cookie dough on the sheets. And then uh, and that's fine. So instead of in other words, instead of cooking from scratch, you're now actually buying ready-made cookie dough, dropping it on the cookie sheet, and then putting it in the oven. But the, the point I'm trying to get to here uh, is that it's still good because the smells are going to fill the kitchen and that's going to smell wonderful. Your person is going to be happy because all those endorphins you're involved in this activity together and it's a lovely activity and um, it all works out. But number one, you've kept her safe and number two, you didn't take it away from her. And so um, this is a gradual process, but really what happens is that the size of the activity is going to continually shrink as the person's performance declines. So in other words, as a person declines, you're going to keep stepping in and doing a little bit more. And actually in the later stages of the illness, activities are going to become more sensory. And I'm going to give you some examples of that now. And I do apologize for the poor uh, job I did in relating the cooking example. I should stick to what I know. Let's talk about some sensory activities. So. Um, Research has shown that the use of sensory stimulation is a great tool um, and it can reduce behaviors as well as psychological symptoms. Um, and as verbal communication tends to decline in this illness, individuals with dementia can really benefit greatly from sensory engagement. So we'll talk about touch and we'll talk about um, sight and sound and smell. 
but let's start with touch. So uh, you might want to think about uh, feeling different fabrics. We actually were just doing this with a, a client uh, who happened, we, we were working with a family and guess what the occupation of the person with dementia was. She used to be a seamstress and the family was kind of stuck with what can we do with mom? So we got, we had them get all different kinds of fabric and had her work with some of the fabrics. And even though she can no longer sew, she was very happy with, uh, you know, just the, ta the tactile part of working with the different types of fabric. Uh, identifying shapes by touch, uh, giving lotion hand massages, Identifying everyday items in a bag by touch, uh, petting animals, visiting with animals, petting something furry, that would probably be my favorite, uh, sculpting, using non-toxic materials, using something like Play-Doh maybe, or other materials. All of those things are tactile and might be very nice, especially for people who are later stage. And Melissa, you jump in here too, if you can think of anything. Okay, we will do. Thanks. Yeah. Um, how about sensory activities involving sight? Uh, you can put together like a picture book, you can laminate pictures of things that would be interesting for the person or people that you're caring for to look at together. Um, you can watch videos of animals or nature uh, or travel logs perhaps, looking at photo albums together, um, looking at photos of famous paintings or famous places or people from the past, if that works. Uh, bird watching, maybe outside or even from inside or the patio. Painting, I mentioned before, with watercolors. Or just sit outside, go sit by an open window together or go sit on the patio or in the garden. All of those things are awfully nice. What about sound? You can listen to familiar music together. Or you can listen to, and you know, the internet is great for all of us, listen to recordings of the sounds of nature, uh, farm sounds, city sounds, or animals. Um, you can use musical instruments, uh, listen to songs or speech in the person's native language, because as you know, with dementia, people often revert to their native language, even if they've been speaking English for a very long time. So you can read books or poetry or articles to the person. Um, you may be wondering if they are able to comprehend what you're saying. I wouldn't get stuck or worry about that too much. I know that a lot of times the person just likes hearing the sound of your voice. Uh, so speak and read slowly and gently is my advice. Smell. Um, I tried that first one. It wasn't as successful for me. It might be successful for you, just kind of doing smell testing. Um, but what really worked for me was the fragrant, uh, the fragrant lotions. Uh, and I've used essential oils as well, just so the person isn't allergic or has a reaction. But the, I love the essential oils and the lotions for hand massages. Um, and then just, you know, cooking or feeding the person foods that smell good, such as apple pie or chicken soup. And I know a lot of the care communities that I visit um, or have visited in the past, you know, have bread machines or cookie machines. They've got something cooking all the time and you walk in and, oh my gosh, it's wonderful. It just smells like home and it just evokes a lot of powerful um, memories. So that's always a good idea. Flowers smell good, definitely. And then um, in general, I mean, there's just such a full um, range of activities 
that can engage the mind, body, and soul. Um, and I love everything on this list, especially music and singing, uh, rhythm and movement, uh, art. We, of course, love the Memories of the Making program. And I want to pause there just for a minute and just tell you a, a story about, you know, one of the early, just before the program even started years and years ago, we had, um, it was sort of the genesis of the program. In fact, we had a man in a daycare center uh, down in South County that was painting the same scene over and over again. Very simple scene. It was a, um, like a river bank with a tree uh, over the river, like a weeping willow tree. Kept painting the same little simple scene every day and um, they finally thought to ask his wife one day when she came to pick him up if she knew if that had any significance and I should add that this man was very far into the disease and was not verbal at all, wasn't really able to speak and when she saw the paintings she started to cry and said that's where we got married. Um, that was the place where we got married and that became a sacred place in our lives. We returned to that spot many times um, for anniversaries and we brought our children there for picnics and you know that's a very that was a very important message that uh, was that he was painting that he still remembered and that uh, he was communicating without words and so that was really the beginning of the Memories in the Making program when we discovered that people you know, and, and folks, this is like back in the late 80s, we learned that people could communicate without using words. So I'm telling you that even late into the disease, we are able to tap into the essence of who people are through these these activities. And, and um, so reminiscence activities, exercise, spiritual activities, again, people don't lose their essence. The core of who they are is present throughout the entire disease and so um, it's a incumbent upon us as their caregivers and 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 loved ones to uh, bring this out in them and we have the ability to do this and so um, yeah uh, even daily care is an activity everything you do with a person is an activity and so um, Melissa can you tell them about what you do with your mother with the groom with the hair oh uh washing her hair is that what you're yeah. asking about yeah yeah so uh my mom's in in late stages now of alzheimer's disease but um uh i would uh, make washing her hair um kind of a fun activity because she uh, was pretty resistant like most people are to to bathing um so but she would never refuse if i would say you know do you want do you want me to do your hair today do you want me to curl your hair and she would get very excited and, and we actually um bought a salon chair like a hairdresser's chair offline we we went the full uh, nine yards and uh, made it a whole day and it was it was a lot of fun it became it went from a, a task that was kind of hard to do and difficult and um ensued a lot of frustration into something that we both really enjoyed for a, a good period of time so yeah, yeah thanks beautiful. for letting me share that <laughs> yeah thank you so much so what started out to be a, a resistant type of task turned into a beautiful day of beauty and so yeah thank you so much as a reminder everybody just because that was the last poll question doesn't mean you can leave us because it has not been 60 minutes and if you don't stay for 60 minutes you don't get your CE credit so I hope I don't mean to sound threatening there <laughs> anyway <laughs> just want to remind you to stay with me because I want you to get your full credit all right so I want to spend the next few minutes just giving you just parse out some examples of activities that you can do early middle and late stage and so just sort of take a look at the list here and you know there are many other ideas and we have attached some handouts as well but playing for those of you who are old enough to remember that show on television name that tune um, you can do that you can um, do some volunteering activities and that is a great idea because that really speaks to their need to really remain feel like they're remaining productive you can do things in the community um, together I know one of my clients here has been working for first harvest for a long time packaging up 
food boxes for the homeless. And it's the perfect repetitious activity that he and his wife do together. And so that's a great example. Um, garden, walk, work out of the gym, household activities and chores are great because again, there's that repetition, news times, um, cognitive games, exercising, dancing, word games, cooking together. That's going to be you and me, Melissa. You're going to teach me. <laughs> I can't <right>. wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay, middle stage. Sorting, uh, puzzles, checkers, again, being out in nature, bird watching, walking, music, dancing, arts and crafts, um, photo albums, household duties, but you're just going to cue that person more. Everything, you've got to just step up your game a little more with middle stage, give more prompts, give more cues, give a little more assistance. Again, here's where you're kind of right-sizing things, folding clothes, sweeping, dusting, um, household chores, fun with music, old records, um, sing-alongs, etc. And then later stage, again, like I said earlier, we're going to get more sensory um, in nature. So fabrics, bean bags are great. Stuffed animals to cuddle, quiet, soothing music, gentle massage, um, hair brushing, reminiscing. Um, I recommend a, mu a memory box. And actually, that's good for any stage. You can fill it with old family pictures, uh, objects of value. Um, you know, if it's a person who served in the military, maybe medals or awards, um, it could be anything. Maps, I know a person that I cared for for a long time, she had a little diary, I put that in there. Uh, you know, you, you, this is the memory boxes are great because um, they're, it provides something that the person can do on their own, you know, and that's good when caregivers are busy. It's good for the person to have something that they can do when they're just sitting quietly. Uh, pet therapy is great for all stages, but particularly late stage. It brings a lot of comfort. Touch therapy, um, massage involving maybe, again, the essential oils, the lotions, riding in the car if that works. I know I did that with my client for a long time, but then um, she became agitated in late stage and... Um, began hallucinating when we were out and so it was no longer appropriate but we did it for many years and it was wonderful so you just use your own gauge on that um, sitting outside wrapped in a blanket together in the sunshine just making a connection if there's you know and th something I would stress more than anything is that you're not Try to knock yourself out thinking of like fancy activities, but just really focus on instead making a connection because sitting and holding hands with someone and having them with a big smile on their face to me is much more important than doing some kind of creative activity. So the connection is what we're after. Okay. Oh, and there it is. <laughs> important considerations. Focus on the connection rather than, you know, any task at hand. And keep in mind that no matter how far people with dementia have progressed in the disease, they just never, ever lose the desire to communicate and to connect with others. And a final photo by Kathy Greenblatt. This is Lucille. She was a dementia patient in uh, France. And she loved pets, and so when she became a hospice uh, a resident, she, um, her family requested pet therapy every day, and so they, by gosh, she had it. She had pet therapy every day and up until the last day of her life, and it, as you can see from her face and her expression, that brought her so much joy. And so that's what we are all about, is bringing joy to the individuals that we serve with dementia. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. That was that was wonderful. Such wonderful stories. Great information. I hope everyone found it uh, very useful with practical tools. Um, we have a bit of time for Q&A. So we already have some good questions, but feel free to type in any questions that you have. Um, I want to take this time to thank our wonderful sponsors once more for making these presentations possible. Chatterton and Associates, the Wealth Management Team, O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choices Hospice and Palliative Services, 
and Caring Companions at Home. Very, very generous sponsors. Um, next month, we will not have a webinar. It is December. Um, enjoy the holidays. But in January, we will have a webinar um, and you get me next time. Um, I Yay. will be speaking on assisting with activities of daily living in dementia care. So it sounds like a similar topic, but we're going to be talking more about um, some of the basic ADLs that uh, begin to uh, become difficult and how we can assist uh, our loved ones and our patients with those uh, activities. I'm very excited about that. Um, if we do run a few minutes over, um, you're welcome to remain online, but if you need to leave, you can. Just remember, you need to be online for 60 minutes to earn that CE credit. Um, all right, so let's get to a few questions we have here. Um, one question is, can you suggest any books or other resources that family members can look into to find out more information about dementia? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, actually, you know, we're in the process of, of uh, upgrading our website now uh, yes, to we include um, a bibliography. Uh, I mentioned the David Troxell books. Well, that's more specific to the activities. Um, I'm not sure how to answer this. Melissa? Yeah, there's there's no shortage of resources out there. Um, yeah, our website's a great many. place to start. Check out um, www.alzoc.org. Um, as Kim mentioned, we are in the process of, of um, making those resources, um, just multiplying them. Um, do call our helpline, and this is for anyone out there. Um, we have a helpline, a wonderful staff that can lead you to resources. Uh, the number's 844-HELP-ALLS, H-E-L-P-A-L-L. LZ, sorry about that. Uh, again, 844-435-7259, and that's a great place to start. Um, but I can, I will also um, reach out to that person that asked questions. And, and um, yeah, I mean, there's there's so many great books now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Absolutely. we we we, sh we could provide a whole bibliography, and I think that Absolutely. we should start to do that on our website. Yeah. Yeah, great idea. Thank you. Thank you for yes. stimulating that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, um, here's a good question. Um, this person's asking about either the side by side or best friends approach. Um, and she asks, is the hand over hand approach also helpful uh, with these approaches? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe that we need to give as much prompting and cueing and side by side and hand over hand as we can with activities. And we have to participate fully ourselves as well. I know I've had uh, time, I do activities with our clients here at ALS OC. And I've had people say, can I observe? And I say, no, but you can participate. Because I feel like we have to model everything for people and that that really helps to encourage people. So, you know, we modeling it can help people to, a lot of times people have just kind of lost their starter button. So if we model whatever it is that we want them to do, that, that'll that help them to get started and then continue in the activity. Absolutely. All right, uh, a couple more here. How do you balance sensory activities and a higher prevalence of overstimulation? So. Well, I think it's, it's, it's so individual. It's case by case um, what people can tolerate. I know that some of our clients that we have, for example, here, are very noise intolerant. So, you know, we, we're going to have a special approach with them. I think it just, you have to know your residents or know your loved one and discover each individual person's mix of activities that works best for them. So I don't think there's a recipe that can, it's not a one size fits all. Would you, Melissa, would you yeah. add anything to that? Nope, absolutely. It's just a lot of trial and error sometimes. And the better you know the person, the better able mm -hmm. you'll be. Um, all right, let's ask one more good question that we got here. Um, what advice do you have for family members who are still working but have a stay-at-home spouse with early stage dementia? This person said they're at age 60. How can I create activities for her for the 10 plus hours a day that I'm not at home? Oh boy, that's a long time yeah. to be home alone. <laughs> that makes me nervous. I'm going to right off the bat recommend an early stage adult day services program. Uh, I know that, that not everybody can afford to do that, 
but that's a very long time for someone to be home alone. And so uh, if you call our helpline, we can tell you about a couple of programs in Orange County that are particularly for people in the early stages. Uh, apart from that, I think there's some computer programs. I know a lot of our early stage clients have tablets that their caregivers uh, set up with uh, particular programs on them for the individual to use. Uh, and then, you know, maybe, uh, you know, set them up with paints, you know, they could paint. Uh, the memory box that I talked about could be chock full of, of activities that they could do on their own that really map to their interests. Um, but that's just really a super long time to be home alone. So by going to an early stage uh, adult day services program, they could be engaged in socialization with others who are walking in their shoes. They could be uh, participating in activities that are stimulating, brain stimulating. So I think it would be a real win-win for them to participate in programs like that. Uh, the other thing they could do is you could, if, if finance is permitted, uh, hire a companion for them to, like a uh, someone to go to the gym with them, take them to the gym and work out, you know, or to, to go out walking with them. Uh, I think companionship is needed. Uh, what would you say, Melissa? Absolutely. Um, I think all of your suggestions are wonderful. We love adult day centers, um, enlisting the help of friends and neighbors, anyone that could come by just for short shifts, I think mm -hmm. is a great idea. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's, yeah, that's a tough situation. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah, trying to enlist the uh, help of friends would be really great too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like that. Absolutely. Well, thank you everyone for participating. Thank you to Kim. Um, this brings us to the conclusion of our webinar. Um, please do watch for that survey that will open up immediately as I end this webinar. Um, it is required if you want CE credit. And we do love to hear all of your feedback. So please, um, please don't hesitate to give us some good feedback. Um, thank you all. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for the great job that all of you do. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.